Hello and good morning and welcome to this uh, class on the most important system, the central nervous system. We will be talking in detail about the CNS today and making sure that you understand most of it, if not all of it. Let's start with the first slide. The to just to tell you how important the central nervous system is, I would like to go to the slide. The human nervous system is an organ of consciousness, intelligence and is the most intricate structure known to exist. Even nature understands how important the system is. Hence, one third of the 35,000 genes that are encoded in the human genome are expressed in the nervous system. That tells us how important this system is to all of us. Each mature brain is composed of 100 billion neurons and miles and miles of axons and nerve fibers to make sure that we have a normal life. To make sure that we are able to complete and do a comprehensive study of the central nervous system, there are various ways to approach the CNS. These are the important ways that I have come across. One is the pathology based approach, the etiology based approach and the approach that is based on the anatomical axis. The pathology based approach is the one that hinders on what is the pathology behind the disease. For example, we have got ion transmission and channelopathies which has the epilepsy syndromes, the migraine syndrome, the periodic paralysis etc. The neurotransmitter imbalance syndromes which are related to imbalance in the acetylcholine or imbalance in the GABA which manifest in various ways as Alzheimer's, Parkinsonism myasthenia gravis so on. The gene transcription defects, the degenerative hypoxic injury, infection and inflammation are the important approaches. The next approach is the etiology based approach which is infective, vascular, traumatic, drug and toxin induced, degenerative, neoplastic and miscellaneous. However, I prefer the anatomical axis based approach because according to me this is the most methodical and organized approach to study the central nervous system. It is also easy to remember and recollect because it is almost impossible to memorize all the pathology that is related to the CNS if we go about in an unorganized manner. Like to summarize the approach, the central nervous system as you can see is grossly divided into the pyramidal system and the extra pyramidal system. The pyramidal system is the main system, the extra pyramidal system also called as the accessory system which com consists of the basal ganglia complex. The pyramidal system is further subdivided into upper motor neuron and lower motor neuron. The upper motor neuron part consists of the cortex, the subcortex, internal capsule, brain stem and the spinal cord. The lower motor neuron starts from the anterior horn cell going to the root and the radical to the plexus, the peripheral nerve, neuromuscular junction and the muscle. We are going to discuss each of the levels, anatomical levels and how they are going to have an impact on the signs and symptoms of the disease. We have to understand that the main part in the CNS is to anatomically localize the lesion. Hence, we are going to discuss in short, the signs and symptoms which are pathognomic of a particular anatomical level. We will start with the highest level that is the cortex. The cortex is mainly involved in doing the cognitive functions and the speech functions, the language functions and the complex motor activities. Hence, the some symptoms and signs related to the cortex are sensorium, convulsion, aphasias, memory and calculation impairment apraxias, homonymous hemianopia and cortical sensation loss point towards a cortical involvement. The subcortex was thought to be almost a dead place where nothing much used to happen but however it has been brought into vogue by HIV related progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy and the dementia syndromes. However, there is nothing specific which is pathognomic of the subcortical lesions. The third level is the internal capsule as we are all aware of in our MBBS days each case presentation that we have all done of hemiparesis definitely has got a case of hemiplegia which is related to internal capsule lesions. It basically manifests as a complete hemiplegia, dense hemiplegia. So what is a complete hemiplegia and what is incomplete hemiplegia? 
complete hemiplegia is the hemiplegia which is involvement of same side of the body and same side upper motor neuron facial on the same side of the hemiplegia is called as a complete hemiplegia. Incomplete hemiplegia when the upper motor neuron facial is spared on the side of the hemiplegia. As we are all familiar with internal capsule is a place where the pyramidal fibers are packed together hence a small lesion also produces a big neurological deficit. The next level is the brain stem which we are all familiar with which is composing of the midbrain, the pons and the medulla. The most pathognomic of brain stem syndromes is the crossed hemiparesis which suggests that cranial nerve involvement happens on the ipsilateral side of the brain stem lesion and the hemiparesis happens on the contralateral side due to the crossing of the pyramidal fibers. Another important thing to note is that the brain stem is supplied by the posterior cerebral artery territory while the other the cortex of course has a supply from both anterior, middle and posterior cerebral artery circulation. Various syndromes which we definitely have to remember which are related to the brain stem. Before we go on to them let us just revisit the brain stem circulation in short. This is just to tell you that there is here is the origin of the vertebral artery which is a direct branch from the aorta. Then it continues further joins together from both sides to form the basilar artery gives the anterior and posterior inferior cerebellar artery. Then it goes on to join the circle of villis. From the center there is the distal part of the internal carotid artery which gives rise to the middle cerebral artery which eventually supplies major part of the brain through the lenticulostriate branches. They are further communicating with the anterior communicating artery and the anterior cerebral artery. Now we are concentrating on the brain stem part hence these are the four levels as shown in the diagram. A and B correspond to the brain stem syndromes that is the midbrain syndromes. C corresponds to the pontine syndrome and D to the medullary syndromes. Let us start with each of them. What is important in our MCQs is to know which cranial nerve is involved and what are the clinical manifestations of that particular syndrome. Remember though it is sounding complex it is quite simplified and an important way to score marks in the CET. Starting with the midbrain syndromes you have to remember always connect try to connect the origin of the cranial nerves from that particular level and that will help you localize the lesion to that particular level. Starting with the first syndrome we have got Weber syndrome. The site of course along with the midbrain is the cerebral peduncle. Hence the cranial nerve involved is the ipsilateral third nerve with contralateral hemiplegia. This is the most classical of brainstem syndrome a crossed hemiplegia with ipsilateral third nerve and contralateral hemiplegia. Benedict syndrome involves the red nucleus and along with affection of ipsilateral third nerve presents as contralateral tremor, chorea and athetosis due to the red nucleus involvement. The Nothnagel syndrome involves the superior cerebellar peduncle and along with the ipsilateral third nerve presents as contralateral cerebellar ataxia. Claude syndrome is a combination of Benedict's and Nothnagel's which involves the red nucleus plus the superior cerebellar peduncle. Hence it manifests as ipsilateral third nerve palsy and contralateral tremor, chorea, athetosis and cerebellar ataxia. Going to the Pontine syndromes, these are the two important syndromes we need to be familiar with. One is the Fovil syndrome which is the classical one which we remember along with crossed seven nerve palsies. One involves the dorsal pons. It presents as ipsilateral sixth and seven nerve palsies and manifesting as lateral gaze palsy and contralateral hemiparesis. The Millard Gubler variant is very close to it involving the ventral pons, involving the ipsilateral seven but only the sixth fascicle is involved and not the nerve nucleus is left spared. Hence it does not present as a complete gaze palsy but presents only as an abducent palsy with contralateral hemiparesis. We go on with the medullary syndromes, the medial medullary and the lateral medullary syndrome. The medial medullary syndrome involves the ipsilateral 12th nerve with contralateral incomplete hemiparesis 
and contralateral impairment of tactile and proprioceptive sense due to the medial lamniscus involvement. The lateral medullary syndrome which we are all familiar is involving the ipsilateral fifth nerve and ipsilateral fibers of the ninth and tenth nerve manifesting as ataxia of the limbs falling to the side of the lesion, Horner syndrome which consists of meiosis, tosis, anhydrosis, loss of taste due to nucleus and tractus solitaris involvement and numbness of ipsilateral arm, trunk and leg. Also it has got contralateral loss of pain and thermal sense due to the spinothalamic tract involvement. Pay attention that there is no hemiplegia involved in this particular syndrome. Hence, it is a unique syndrome this is corresponding only with ataxia and not with a typical pyramidal weakness. The basilar artery syndrome, also called as the syndrome of the lone vertebral artery, involves presence with bilateral long track signs with involvement of almost everything like a high spinal cord lesion or a high quadriparesis. It involves both sensory and motor, cerebellar and peripheral cranial nerve abnormalities and presents as quadriparesis with all bulbar musculature weakness, corticobulbar and corticospinal affection, hence presenting as a locked-in syndrome or pseudocoma. The miscellaneous syndromes related to brainstem are complete medullary syndrome, which is due to the occlusion of the vertebral artery, which combines the symptoms of medial as well as lateral medullary syndrome. Occlusion of the internal carotid artery leads to blindness due to the involvement of the ophthalmic artery which is a direct branch of the internal carotid artery which is called as amorox fugox. We have to remember that whenever there is a posterior circulation TIA, we have to ask the question whether there has been a history of transient blindness or transient blackout because that may be the pathognomic feature predicting a future PCA infarction. Though these, though these syndromes have been documented very well, none of these syndromes present as a classical picture because of the gross overlap of territories, the small area of the brainstem and also rich collateral supply. Hence, we are always going to see an overlap of these syndromes more than the classical particular type. Going on after brainstem to the cranial nerve disorders, let us start with the first nerve, the olfactory nerve as we are all familiar with is related to the sense of smell. Bilateral um, loss of smell or altered smell is usually not useful and usually suggests a local pathology. For neurology point of view, unilateral anosmia is helpful in detecting frontal lobe tumors that is meningiomas. Parosmia is altered smell, presents mainly as aura of temporal lobe epilepsy and also as we have read in our ENT chapter is an important feature of atropic rhinitis. The second cranial now is a very important one, but we want to concentrate on the MCQ point of view. The optic now has various facets. When we are examining the optic now, we are going to examine the color vision, the normal vision, the field of vision, the retina and the pupillary reflexes. When vision is worse than 6 by 60, it is the definition for being legally blind. The field of lesion is an easy formula to remember for all of us is 90, 75, 75, 60 from temporal to inferior in counterclockwise direction. Homonymous hemianopia is always due to cortical or subcortical infarction. Bitemporal hemianopia is due to optic chiasmal lesions. These are the two things that you should definitely remember due to the loads of MCQs based on them. When visual examination is normal with loss of vision, it is to, due to cortical blindness or infarction of the occipital cortex. The third, fourth, sixth now are always discussed together due to the close proximity and the relation to the extraocular muscle innervation. The main symptom related to third now is tosis, that is drooping of the eyelid, which may be unilateral or bilateral. Now let us discuss here that when I, it's an important tip that. When we discuss any disorder which is unilateral in nature, we are usually trying to look at the things that is suggestive of a local pathology. When we get a bilateral symptom or a bilateral clinical sign, you should always think of systemic disorder or a generalized disorder. So when I talk about unilateral tosis, we are going to start obviously with the local causes first. So due to local trauma, due to local injury, due to one-sided third nerve palsy, are the common causes of tosis on one side. 
when we talk about bilateral ptosis we go on to the congenital ptosis syndrome and those due to secondary to a systemic disorder pay attention these are the causes of ptosis which are extremely important one important feature is myasthenia gravis second is snake envenomation and thirdly it is related to botulinum toxin all these are not uncommon in a country like india and we need to be familiar with the presence of ptosis and the differential diagnosis for the same after ptosis we have got the light and the accommodation reflex which are important reflex of the pupillary reaction here we have to remember that both in both the reflexes the afferent pathway that is the pathway that conducts the impulse to the brain is through the optic nerve and the efferent pathway is the oculomotor nerve which is tested in this case along with that we should always be familiar with argyle robertson pupil which is an important stigmata of neurosyphilis thirdly we go on to the importance of the sixth nerve involvement being a feature of a false localizing sign now in neurology what are we doing it is like mathematics that when we get a sign when we get a symptom we are going to correlate and try to localize the anatomy of the lesion when we get a six now palsy we usually try to trace from the origin of the six now nucleus to the bottom but due to its long intracranial course it can get affected even when there is no direct involvement of the six now which is commonly in states with raised intracranial tension manifesting as papilledema this is called as a false localizing sign because though six now is intact it still presents as a six now palsy hence we should be familiar with the same isolated third now palsies are not uncommon especially india is the diabetes capital of the world diabetes is an important cause of cranial mononeuropathy and third now palsy definitely is quite common the important thing that we want to note in this sign is that in diabetic patients in the third nerve palsy presents classically with pupillary sparing while in other causes of third nerve palsy pupil is always affected coming back to this slide we have got the cranial now next cranial now trigeminal we have got this it is a sense mixed now a sensory as well as a motor now the sensory distribution is you have to be very familiar with that it typically supplies the part of the face the half of the face except for the angle of the jaw so it why is it important in localizing the lesion again this part is extremely important so there are various involvement so what is the angle of the jaw supplied to it is supplied by the c2 nerve root supplies the angle of the jaw hence it is important to know this sensory loss distribution that we have got the face here excuse the diagram we have to just make do this is the mouth and this is the angle of the jaw so this is the distribution which is supplied by the c2 root the rest of the face is supplied by the trigeminal nerve so what are the ways that it can be present one entire face there are no sensation is scenario number 1 two half of the face is lost with preservation of the angle of mouth but angle preserved and lastly we have got only the angle inward so this is very easy to start with from beho- behind when only angle of the jaw is involved it is due to the compression or the c2 nerve root involvement when we get the entire half of face lost but the angle preserved it is due to trigeminal nerve involvement now usually in clinical practice this is considered very ominous because more often than not it is suggestive of a cp angle tumor when the entire face is lost obviously it cannot be the trigeminal plus the ct root it has to be something where the common pathway ends which is a thalamic lesion so this is how based on the sensory loss over the face we can localize the lesion anatomically also the importance of trigeminal nerve is that it is an important afferent for jaw jerk reflex 
when we are performing a jaw jerk reflex we are looking mainly for pseudo bulbar palsy and bulbar palsy when you have got bilateral cortical signs jaw jerk becomes exaggerated or positive and it is mediated to the trigeminal nerve which we want to be familiar with the next nerve we want to deal with is the facial nerve as we are all familiar very important nerve very common nerve that is involved we want to be first familiar that how to differentiate between a umn and a lmn facial nerve though it must have been repeatedly taught in our clinical classes it is prudent that we continue revising because this is an important topic second thing you all should definitely know about is the course of the facial nerve so what are the important questions that are relevant from our mcq point of view that which is the first route from the facial nerve it is the greater superior petrosal nerve followed by once it goes into the internal auditory canal it gives the rule which is now which is now to stapedius and also which is giving to the lacrimal duct after exiting from the internal auditory meatus from the mastoid foramen it comes ahead and branches behind the parotid into the five peripheral branches we have to be familiar that in a upper motor neuron type of facial palsy upper half of the face is spared this is due to bilateral representation of the upper part of the face in the cortex if it is a lmn lesion then the entire half of the face is completely paralyzed and called as a lmn facial palsy coming to the lmn facial palsy what is important is that along with involvement of full of the face there is also an important phenomena which is called as bell's phenomenon now i want to make you aware that do not get confused between bell's phenomenon and bell's palsy bell's phenomenon is present in all lmn facial palsies what is bell's phenomenon just it is when the person tries to close his eyes there is uprolling of eyeballs hence a feeling that the eyes are rolling upwards but actually it is because the eyelid is lagging behind it is the called as bell's phenomena bell's phenomena is present in all lmn facial palsies however bell's palsy is the facial palsy element type which is idiopathic in nature so there are many causes for element type of facial palsy commonly it is post ent surgeries it may be leprosy it may be diabetes or it may be local trauma but bell's palsy is the most common form of element type of facial palsy and it is idiopathic in nature so let we should know something about bell's palsy it is a idiopathic form typically thought to be a post viral phenomenon and inflammation of the nerve in the internal auditory meatus hence the therapy recommended or commonly used in practice is a combination of acyclovir plus steroid for a duration of 5 to 7 days to make the inflammation subside down 80% of these patients will recover spontaneously and lead a near normal life 20% may have some remaining neuro deficit which may take up to 6 weeks 6 months to recover that is about bell's palsy when we have to grossly differentiate between a upper motor neuron and lower motor neuron it may be very easy but when it comes that question comes that the person has got a bilateral umn or a bilateral lmn facial palsy then how are you going to differentiate because now the entire half of the face is blocked on both the sides that is where the importance of emotional fibers come Fa the emotional fibers are also supplied by the facial nerve which will remain intact if it is a bilateral upper motor neuron type of palsy while if it's a lower motor neuron type this is the end final pathway all fibers are cut off and patient loses emotional stability hence the patient is has a complete mask like face which documents or with pathognosis characterizes a bilateral lower motor neuron type of facial palsy hyperacusis is an important symptom which is intolerance to loud sound this is due to the defect in the nerve to trapezius now to stapedius if it occurs the defect occurs in the internal auditory meatus coming to the next nerve which is the auditory nerve the auditory nerve has basically a vestibular as well as cochlear uh, component the main symptom related is vertigo which will be discussed by our ent colleagues and hearing loss also important test of vestibular nerve that we want to know is the caloric test because as i know it has come into vogue that there is a phenomena of brain death now we will discuss this further when we discuss the phenomena of sensoria but just in short caloric test is an important test which helps us to define 
what is brain death or loss of brain stem reflexes. The 9th and the 10th cranial nerve together are very simple and usually they are tested using the gag reflex. The 11th now supplies the trapezius and sternocleidomastoid and the 12th is basically checked by trunk protrusion and the tongue movement. What is important is that when we get an involvement of the cranial nerve, the 12th cranial nerve, there is deviation of the tongue on the same side of the lesion. That is what you need to remember, which is hypoglossal palsy. And when there is a lower motor neuron type of hypoglossal palsy, you may see fasciculations over the tongue. Come to the next level of spinal cord. Come to this slide. So we have got the spinal cord, the last part of the upper motor neuron, which basically the typical presentation is a symmetrical bilateral presentation because of the small area of the cord and small area where all the fibers, the ascending as well as the descending tracts are all clubbed together. Hence, brown sequard syndrome or hemisection of a cord is only of academic importance. Root pain, cord pain, funicular pain may be there, radicular pain may be there. Motor plus sensory affection is common, autonomic system is also involved because all the fibers are clubbed together in the spinal cord. The typically there is bladder and bowel involvement and characterized by flexor spasms and clonus. The anterior horn cell is the first part of the lower motor neuron which usually presents as a pure motor lesion because remember it is the dorsal root which is the sensory root. Commonly unilateral, the classical example is poliomyelitis. Coming to the radical or plexus, these are characterized by symptoms which are involving that particular nerve root distribution rather than one individual nerve. Hence, the example is herbs or clump case palsies and Saturday night palsies or clutch palsy which is present due to the radical or brachial plexopathy. Coming to the peripheral nerve, usually it is a mix of motor and sensory symptoms or autonomic symptoms. The sensory symptoms are further divided into positive and negative phenomena. Positive phenomena are those which are characterized by tingling numbness, paresthesias, allodynia and so on and negative symptoms are characterized by loss of sensation. It is usually asymmetrical at onset and eventually becomes symmetrical. The important thing to note in peripheral neuropathy is that more the distance from the spinal cord or the origin of the nerve more the damage. Hence the classically the peripheral nerve disorders start peripherally or distally and then progress proximally. Neuromuscular junction disorders are characterized by fluctuating motor weakness. That is typically on exertion there is either improvement or worsening of the motor power which is the most pathognomic sign of a NMJ pathology. The classical examples are myasthenia and Eaton-Lambert syndrome. The last part of the UMN chain is the muscle which is classically pure motor of course in nature characterized by atrophy or pseudo hypertrophy of the muscle, fasciculations and involvement of specific groups. Thus to summarize the pyramidal distribution or the anatomical axis of the pyramidal chain, the upper motor neuron extends from the cortex to the spinal cord, the lower motor neuron starts at the anterior horn cell and goes till the muscle. The upper motor neuron type of lesion presents with hypertonia and spasticity where spasticity is more predominant in the anti-gravity group of muscles. The lower motor neuron presents with hypotonia or flaccidity. Upper motor neuron is manifested by exaggerated deep tendon jerks and LMN by absent or diminished DTR. The UMN has absent abdominal reflex where lower motor neuron it is preserved. Extensor Babinski's is a classical sign of upper motor neuron while absent or mute or normal Babinski's may be present in a element lesion. However, there is no muscle wasting or fasciculation in the upper motor neuron lesions while they are almost a sure shot feature of a lower motor neuron disease. Coming to the extra pyramidal symptom system which is also called as the accessory nervous system. Why is it accessory? Because it does not initiate or do any work itself, but it, it however controls the coordination, the balance and fine tuning of motor movements which are brought about by the pyramidal symptom. Hence, any lesion of the extrapyramidal symptom 
rather than presenting as a focal neurological deficit presents as involuntary movements. We need to be familiar with this involuntary movements though they are very large in number. I have tried to summarize with clinically relevant ones put together so that we understand the involuntary movements very promptly. Starting with intention tremor, the site of involvement is the cerebellum and tremor is only on action. We are all familiar with that. The resting tremor is a classical feature of substantia nigra and red nucleus involvement and Parkinson's disease. It is present at rest only and it is abolished by action. I have mentioned asterix is here though it is not a classical involuntary movement because it is commonly confused with tremor. However, tremor is basically when there is an alternate flickering of the muscle while asterix is, is when there is actually intermittent muscle relaxation. Hence, tremor may be present on rest or on intention while asterix is has to be elicited by making the person perform a complex motor function. Asterixis usually localizes the lesion to the cortex and is a common feature of metabolic encephalopathy which includes hypercarbia, hepatic encephalopathy, uremic encephalopathy and so on. Rigidity again a classical feature one of the triad of Parkinsonism presents as a lesion of substantia nigra and putamen which is characterized by hypertonia of both agonist and antagonist. As we just discussed, spasticity is hypertonia of the anti-gravity group of muscles while rigidity is hypertonia of both agonist and antagonist group of muscles. Chorea is a slow rhythmic movement which is characterized by caudate nucleus involvement. There are various choreas that I am sure we are familiar with. One definitely which we are familiar is Sydenham's chorea that related to acute rheumatic fever. Sydenham's chorea by nature can occur precede the acute rheumatic fever or precede the rheumatic fever almost by 6 months to an year. Hence, it is one of the major Jones criteria which is taken as diagnostic of rheumatic fever even if it is present alone. Typically, it involves a young girl who presents with chorea. Chorea as we discussed is a slow rhythmic movement and usually because it is slow in nature, the person tries to attach a purpose making it quasi purposive in nature. Sydenham's chorea is self limiting and it will resolve on its own only requiring reassurance and maybe mild anxiolytics to take away the fear of the movement. The next involuntary movement is hemibalismus that I am sure nobody will miss but I am sure that not many will see. Fortunately, it is a wild, violent flinging movement which makes the patient completely distressed. Typically, it presents due to subthalamic nucleus involvement and the patient is completely jerked due to the hemibalismus movement. The dystonia and the athetosis are involving it's a slow focal dystonia or a full slow focal movement which is due to putamen involvement and is quite a common involuntary movement. The important three list I, I wanted to show you all is the combination of myoclonus, fasciculation and fibrillation. Now pay attention that each of them are related to the muscle. But myoclonus is basically a rapid rhythmic shock like muscle jerk which is present common many times in sleep. We have all got up with a shock or with a jerk. Also it may also suggest a myoclonic epilepsy. Fasciculation on the other hand is a non rhythmic muscle fascicle contraction and it can be best seen in a large muscle like a deltoid quadriceps or calf muscle. It is a classical sign of anterior horn cell degeneration which is a feature of motor neuron disease, syrinx, organophosphorus poisoning, primary muscular atrophy and thyrotoxic and carcinomatous myopathy. Fibrillation on the other hand is twitching of a single muscle fiber which is classically a feature of denervation, hypersensitivity and is best seen on the tongue because over rest of the body there is adequate subcutaneous tissue to mask the single muscle fiber twitching. Myokemia is contraction of bundle of muscle fascicles. We just saw fasciculation is contraction of single fascicle. Myokemia is contraction of a bundle of muscle fascicles 
and it is one of the most common involuntary movement especially of the orbicularis oculi which we are all familiar with mini polymyoclonus is a tremor like sensation or a tremor like movement in the small joints it is due to chronic denervation with renervation a feature of motor neuron disease or a cidp titubation is involuntary nodding of the head it is usually represents a lesion of the vermis of the cerebellum which usually controls the axial skeleton so with this i would like to conclude the first part of the cns which basically included our approach to cns the basic understanding of the brain stem syndromes the cranial nerve palsies so let us start taking by test 1 the first question with which one of the following lower motor neuron lesions are associated the options as you can see are flaccid paralysis hyperactive stretch reflex spasticity and muscular incoordination as we discussed and summarized the umn versus lmn signs it is associated with all of them it is not associated with any but flaccid paralysis fasciculation is seen in question number 2 fasciculation is seen in typically a lower motor neuron type of palsy which is a classical feature of motor neuron disease question number 3 in pyramidal tract lesion all are seen except clasp knife fragility babinski is positive involuntary tremors and none of the above as we discussed in pyramidal all are seen except now here it is a tough choice though the answers have been given by all india in a separate thing class 9 fragility is a extra pyramidal symptom and not a pyramidal symptom hence that can be the correct answer babinski is positive so that is a correct present in pyramidal tract lesions involuntary tremors are not a feature of pyramidal tract disease again it's a extra pyramidal symptom and none of the above so actually class 9 fragility as well as involuntary tremor both are the correct answers question number 4 episodic generalized weakness can occur due to all of the following acute electrolyte disturbances except this is talking about the periodic paralysis syndromes which are commonly present with hypokalemia as well as not uncommon with hyponatremia and hypophosphatemia what does not happen is hypocalcemia related episodic weakness if you get a hypocalcemic tetany it persists and it does not go away and does not reappear periodically hence it is not a part of the episodic weakness syndrome so the correct answer is hypocalcemia episodic muscular weakness question number 5 episodic muscular weakness is seen in again the same question is it hypokalemia is it eaton lambert syndrome is it myasthenia gravis d is it all so the answer is all of the above though they are separate in presentation both myasthenia and Lam eaton lambert are neuromuscular disorders which are characterized by episodic or fluctuating muscle weakness question number 8 hyperkinetic syndromes such as chorea and athetosis are usually associated with pathological change in when we talk about involuntary movements we are talking about the extra pyramidal symptom system or the basal ganglia complex hence the correct answer is the basal ganglia complex question number 7 in metabolic encephalopathy the feature is tonic clonic seizures chorea asterixis or paraplegia the correct answer is asterixis that we just discussed in detail question number 8 all are true about corial movements except irregular jerky present during sleep and quasi purposive we discussed with sydenham's chorea that they are irregular they are jerky and usually the person attaches purpose to it all involuntary during sleep hence present during sleep is the correct answer for our question even hemibalismus the many a times the patient the only treatment is to sedate the patient so that he gets some rest from the involuntary movement hemibalismus is caused by question number 9 hemibalismus is caused by lesions of as we just discussed it is the contralateral subthalamic nucleus 
क्वेश्चन नंबर टेन ऑल आर ट्रू अबाउट सेरिबलर डिजीज एक्सेप्ट इट इज एक्स्ट्रा पिरामिडल इन्वॉल्वमेंट अटैक्सिया इज ऑफकोर्स द फीचर इंटेंशन ट्रेमर इज ऑफकोर्स द फीचर डिसमेट्रिया पास्ट पॉइंटिंग इज ऑल्सो अ फीचर द रॉन्ग और द करेक्ट आंसर इज हाइपरटोनिया सेरिबलर डिजीजेस फीचर हाइपोटोनिया क्वेश्चन नंबर इलेवन एलोडाइनिया इज increased perception of painful stimulus perception of non painful stimulus as painful stimulus pain felt as abnormal sensation none of the above the correct answer is perception of non painful stimulus as painful stimulus question number 12 a person cannot identify a familiar object when placed in the palm when he is blindfolded this condition is called now here let us take opportunity to discuss the various cortical sensations the cortical sensations we can further classify into two point discrimination graphesthesia stereognosis and tactile localization now if it is commonly two point discrimination is commonly performed in clinical examination two point discrimination is for the test for which the patient has to tell when two points are separate from each other now the most sensitive part of the human body is the fingertip and the lip while the least sensitive part of the body for tactile discrimination is the back that is the important part of the tactile discrimination stereognosis is ability to identify known object just by feeling the texture and the shape with a blindfold nature so in our present question it is a stereognosis which is inability to identify the familiar object now the next one is also stereognosis is there two point discrimination is the main important cortical sensation going to the next question question number 13 true about lesion of inferior frontal gyrus is for this you just have to revisit your neuroanatomy textbook the inferior gyrus frontal gyrus It has basically the Broca's area, which is the motor area of the speech, hence presenting as compromised speech, which is involvement of Broca's territory. Next question, question number fourteen is crossed aphasia. We discussed what is crossed hemiplegia, we but what is crossed aphasia? This is basically when the person is a right hemispherical lesion in a right-handed person. usually it is the dominant lobe of the person which has the speech center in a right side right handed person 90% of the cases left side of the brain is dominant even if the person is left handed 50% of the person still have left side dominance hence commonly speech area is located in the left area left side of the brain if the person who is right handed gets a right hemispheric infarct and develops aphasia it is called as crossed aphasia next question question number 15 jargon speech or aphasia is seen in jargon speech is basically when there is no connection between what is the question asked and what is the answer given which is a classical feature of sensory aphasia or wernicke's aphasia the next question question number 16 prosopagnesia is what it is basically inability to recognize the face of a person the person meets the person who is known to the him but is unable to place that who is the exact identity of the person which is prosopagnesia and this is important thing in just the answers we'll complete it that inability to do fine movement will be classified as apraxia inability to recognize face prosopagnesia seen in balint syndrome not really balint syndrome has more of internuclear ophthalmoplegia and lastly justman syndrome is due to lesion of the parietal lobe presenting as a calculia a calculia and hemi neglect next question question number 17 a medial temporal lesion produces a medial temporal lesion a temporal lobe basically is has got lot to do with memory if you pay attention though it is not directly mentioned in any of the textbooks if we pay attention the optic pathway the auditory pathway the smell pathway the sensory pathway all have fibers relating to the temporal lobe 
Now, along with being a center where information is acute related, I am sure there is a somatosensory association area and which is connected to the memory because otherwise these learned activities may not become possible. So, when we are talking about a temporal lobe lesion, we are talking about memory related problems that is memory related learning problems. Visual amnesia only, not really auditory amnesia, apraxia, no. Apraxia as we discussed is a parietal lobe problem. Visual amnesia is more cortical blindness related to occipital lobe. Auditory amnesia is part of temporal lobe but it is part of the lateral temporal syndrome and medial temporal lesion presents as memory disturbances and anterograde learning. Memory disturbance also is further classified into two that is anterograde amnesia and retrograde amnesia. Anterograde amnesia is inability to have new memory while retrograde is loss of already existing memory. Unfortunately, the ones shown in films are really humbug because nobody forgets their name without forgetting the rest of the living. So, if learned activity has to be lost till that time, the person will end up with a large memory disorder. Hence, it is unlikely commonly patients get anterograde amnesia so that after a particular insult, after trauma, after infection, there may be impairment of learning new knowledge but whatever is already learned is going to remain like that. Coming to the next question, question number 18, which of these can cause third nerve paralysis? Now remember that third nerve paralysis, where is the third nerve located? Which of these can cause third nerve paralysis? So where is the third nerve located? It is located in the midbrain. So as we discussed, a midbrain infarct can definitely cause a third nerve pathology. Then can it be a posterior communicating artery aneurysm? Yes, it is involving the PCA territory and posterior communicating artery is the one that is communicating with the circle of villus and very close to the brainstem or the midbrain. Hence, it can also cause third nerve paralysis. Tolosa Hunt syndrome. Tolosa Hunt syndrome is basically cavernous sinus thrombophlebitis which again involves third nerve. Hence, all the lesions of the above can cause third nerve palsies. Coming to next question, all of the following statements are true about Benedict syndrome except. Just revising, Benedict syndrome is involvement of the red nucleus, hence presenting with chorea arthrotosis on the contralateral side with ipsilateral third nerve lesion. Hence, what are the presentation? Third nerve lesion present, contralateral tremor present, involvement of the penetrating branch of the basilar artery present, lesion at the levels of the pons? No, it is at the level of the midbrain, which we all discussed very clearly. Question number 20, Millard Gublar syndrome includes all of the following except. We discussed 6 nerve palsy. It happens due to involvement of the abducent physical not of the nucleus but still 6 nerve palsy remains, 7 nerve palsy is a part of it, yet contralateral hemiparesis. So the odd man out here is a 5th nerve palsy which happens in lateral medullary syndrome. Question number 21, wing beating tremor is seen in Huntington disease, Wilson's disease, Parkinsonism or thyrotoxicosis. Now, wing beating tremor is a classical name given to Wilson's disease. There is no real reason. It is just it resembles a wing beating nature. Hence, a classical feature of Wilson's disease. Question number 22. Flapping tremors, also called as asterixis, are not seen in Wilson's disease, thyrotoxicosis, CO2 narcosis or uremia. We discussed asterixis due to metabolic pathology. Metabolic pathologies include endocrine pathologies, dyselectrolytemias, imbalance of arterial blood gas and imbalance of sugar. Hence, thyrotoxicosis, CO2 narcosis and uremia will definitely have flapping tremors or asterixis while Wilson's disease has no relation hence does not have asterixis. Coming to the next question, question number 23. We have got pseudocoma results from infarction or hemorrhage in. We discussed it. It is usually a basilar syndrome which presents as a locked in state. Also, it can be the lesion at the level of the pons where 
Infection of hemorrhage of the ventral pons transects all the corticospinal corticobulbar fibers, hence presents as a pseudocoma or locked in state. So the answer to the question is pons. Earliest definite sign of death is absent brainstem reflexes, stoppage of mucociliary action in respiratory passage, retinal anterior, anterior column breakdown, none of these. Well, there is no real way to find out the mucociliary transport, but one of the most accepted, accepted criteria for defining brain death is loss of brainstem reflexes. So that is the most appropriate answer. Earliest definite sign of death is absent brainstem reflexes. Coming to the next question, pontine stroke is associated with all except bilateral pinpoint pupil, yes, pyrexia, yes, quadriparesis, yes, we just discussed pseudocoma, of course quadriparesis is part, vagal palsy, the ninth now nucleus or the tenth now star rises at the junction lower end of the pons, more from the medulla. Hence, pontine stroke does not have vagal palsy as a part of the syndrome. Next question, best method to monitor intracranial pressure is intraventricular catheter, subarachnoid bolt, intraparenchymal catheter, epidural catheter. Well, nobody does it anymore these days, but if at all, the correct mo modality is an intraventricular catheter, which I am sure is still done especially in the pediatric age group with obstructed hydrocephalus. Next question, the causes of systemic secondary insult to injured brain include all of the following except hypercapnia, hypoxemia, hypotension, hypothermia. Now pay attention, many of our times the question comes where we are uh, not familiar with the answer as soon as we read the question. But just if you pay attention to the choices, it will be very obvious that which is the correct answer. Hypercapnia is CO2 narcosis which we discussed presents with drowsiness, presents with tremors or asterixis. Hypoxemia of course is an important feature where ischemic insult will occur. Hypotension again part where there is hypotension presenting as syncope, transient ischemic attack or a full fledged stroke may occur due to the episode of hypotension. Hypothermia on the other hand has got a protective effect on the neuronal survival. If you remember all your rom-com serials and Grey's Anatomy, I am sure we are all familiar that when we do a standstill surgery, we have to cool down the body to a hypothermic level, making sure that the person can sustain long hours of general anesthesia and least amount of neuronal hypoxia insult occurs. That is the funda also behind applying it for hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, where patient body is rapidly cooled down to a lower temperature to prevent further hypoxic insult. The most area which is most prone to hypoxic injury is the hippocampus. Now it is just to go again into the detail of neuroanatomy which our class does not permit but just to summarize it is the Purkinje fibers which are most sensitive to hypoxia which line the hippocampal and the periventricular area. Hence when you see commonly see a small vessel disease early ischemic on the MRI you always see a periventricular white matter changes or ischemic changes along with hippocampal involvement. So with that we end